Mm, okay. Okay, so uh, maybe let's start. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. And today I'm going to talk about a new approach to network design problems. And it's widely recognized that the linear programming is the most general and the powerful approach in designing approximation algorithms for network design problems. And uh, our new approach introduces uh, new ingredients from uh, spectral graph theory and the discrepancy theory uh, to the network design problem. And we show that these new elements can be as can significantly extend the scope and uh, of the network design problem. So this uh, talk is based on a joint work with my supervisor Lao Chi. So let's start with some background about uh, network design. Generally speaking, in network design problems, we are given an undirected graph G as input. And each edge has a cost. So the goal of the problem is to find a minimal cost subgraph that satisfies certain requirements. Uh, a family of the where, uh, most well studied uh, network design problem is the so called survivable network design, where we have an additional input, a connectivity requirement FUV for each pair of versus UNV. So the goal is to find a minimal cost subgraph so that there are at least FUV at these joint parts between each pair of versus UNV. So this problem actually captures many classic problems as a special case. For example, the minimal spanning tree problem, the minimal standard tree problem, minimal k-edge connected subgraph problem. Um, this problem, uh, we can formulate this problem as a linear program uh, in the following way. Consider a cut S which separates uh, the versus U and V. So because we need at least FUV at this joint path between U and V, so by Mangle's theorem, we need at least FUV edges crossing the cut S. If we take the maximum over all the pairs of UV uh, that's separated by S, <clears throat> then we need at least F of S uh, edges across in the cut S. So we can write a linear constraint for each of the cut S. Uh, in this way. Um, here, x, xe is an indicator variable that whether we want to pick uh, the edge e into our uh, subgraph. So this is actually an exact formulation of the problem. And uh, we can write a linear programming relaxation for, for this. Um, know that there are exponentially many linear constraints here because we have a linear constraint for each of the cut in S uh, in the graph, but we have polynomial time separation oracle, uh, so we can solve this LP in polynomial time. So a famous result for survivable network design is the iterative rounding algorithm proposed by Jane. So in the algorithm, we are solving the LP repeatedly in each iteration, we will find the extreme point optimal solution X of the LP with respect to the current connectivity requirement F prime. And then we will find an edge with a fractional value at least half and add this edge to our solution graph edge. Then we will update the connectivity requirement F prime and then we will repeat. So the success of this algorithm relies on a very nice structural characterization of the LP stream point solutions. Uh, so we can show for every stream point solution, there must be an edge with fractional value at least half. So the algorithm will be uh, running uh, until, until we get to an integral solution. And uh, because we only rounding up an edge with fractional value at least half, so we are losing at most a factor of two in the cost. So this algorithm gives the two approximation algorithm uh, for, for the survival network design. And the, so far, this is still the best known approximation algorithm for survival network design. 
and uh, the iterative rounding techniques has been extended to many more general settings. For example, the element connectivity, vertex connectivity requirements. So besides the connectivity requirements, uh, we may also want to incorporate more constraints into the network design problem. There has been a long line of research on the degree constraints and the iterative rounding uh, techniques has been successfully extended to handle the degree constraints. And uh, more generally, we may also want to consider the linear packing or covering constraints. And there were some studies on uh, this type of constraints, but not much is known, especially when the, uh, there's no structure underlying the, the constraints. Um, it's also natural to consider the shortest path constraints, uh, but uh, unfortunately it's shown that it's hard to computationally approximate this problem with the shortest path constraints. Okay, so this is uh, this uh, just some background about network design. And then let's move on to talk about uh, our motivations to incorporate uh, the spatial perspective uh, into the network design problem and our new results. So uh, also the linear programming is very powerful and very general, can uh, formulate many of the network design problems. But there are some other natural network design requirements that don't fit into the uh, ILP framework. For example, uh, the graph expansion, effective resistance, um, cover time and mixing time of a random walk on the graph, or commute time uh, between vertices uh, on the graph of a random walk. So as we know from the spiritual graph theory, all these properties are related to the graph spectrum. And the uh, spatial graph theory also tells us that uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix or the Laplacian matrix of a graph actually contains very rich information of the combinatorial structure of a graph. Uh, some simple examples, a graph G is a bipartite graph if and only if the largest uh, uh, eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix is the minus of the minimum eigenvalue. And another example, uh, graph G is connected if and only if the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian matrix is strictly greater than zero. So therefore, uh, it's natural that a network designer want to have better control over all these graph spectrum uh, in the context of network design. So let's consider uh, two concrete examples. Let's start with the algebraic connectivity, which is defined as the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian uh, matrix. So as we just said, a graph G is connected if and only if the algebraic connectivity is strictly greater than zero. Actually, we can have a more quantitative uh, statement, uh, uh, version of, of this statement. Um, more specifically, essentially it's saying if uh, the algebraic connectivity of a graph is large, then we will have fast uh, mixing time of the random walks on this graph. And then we will also have large graph expansion. And graph expansion is defined as the minimum ratio between the uh, edge boundary of a cut set S and the size of S. So essentially, all this is saying that if the algebraic connectivity is large, then this graph is where it's bending. And this is a very useful property in many applications. So the algebraic connectivity will be a useful property to incorporate into the network design. Um, Gosh and the board studied uh, this problem where we want to find a subgraph with certain sets to maximize the algebraic connectivity. Um, there was some progress towards this problem, but in general, the problem has not been settled. And uh, in particular, the known results cannot handle the general edge cost. So uh, in the net network design setting, we may want to ask this question, where we want to find a minimum cost subgraph with a, a algebraic connectivity constraint. 
Okay, is the problem clear? Uh, sorry, uh, when you say minimum cost, so in your definition um, for the network design problems, the cost is the sum of the edge weights, right? The cost is per edge, right? Or yeah, yeah, sum of the edge weight. Yes. I see. So the cost of the subgraph here will be the sums of the edges that are like inside, like inside of the subgraph. Yeah, it's the, yeah. Each edge has a cost CE. We are just summing over all the edges, uh, summing over all the CEs in the subgraph. Actually. In the subgraph. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is the first example, and then let's consider another example: effective resistance. Uh, if I, the effective resistance between the uh, two versus S and T is the voltage difference between S and T when we send one unit of electric flow from S to T. Uh, informally, uh, it's just the resistance between S and T when we treat the whole graph as a big resistor. So effective resistance has many uh, nice properties. Uh, for example, it can be written as a, the minimal L2 energy of the Uni ST flow. And uh, interestingly, the shortest path distance can be uh, can also be written as the minimal L1 energy of the uni ST flow. And the reciprocal of uh, edge connectivity can can be written as the minimal L infinity energy of a uni ST flow. So we can think of the effective resistance as an interpolation of shortest path distance and uh, the edge connectivity. Uh, let's take a look at some more concrete example here. For example, if we have a ST path of length k, then uh, the ST effective resistance is k. Uh, if we have k parallel ST path of length k, then the effective resistance becomes 1. So the effective resistance can distinguish these two, these first two cases, but the shortest path distance cannot distinguish these two. And if we have a k parallel st path of length two, then the effective resistance becomes two over k. So effective resistance can also distinguish the last two cases, but the edge connectivity cannot. So in many applications. Uh, effective resistance may be a better measure on how uh, on the wear connectedness of uh, two verses. Um, there are also many other nice properties of effective resistance. <coughs> Sorry, for example, the effective resistance from a metric over the vertex side in the graph, and the effective resistance. Uh, is directly related to the commute time and the cover time of running works on, on this graph. And the effective resistance can also be written as the quadratic form of the pseudo inverse of the Laplacian matrix. So this is why this uh, effective resistance is related to the graph spectrum. And uh, another nice property is that when effective resistance uh, is written as the function of the edge width x, and this function is actually convex uh, in, in X. So this will be useful when we are uh, writing a convex program for, for, the, for the problem. OK, so recently, effective resistance also found many like, uh, algorithmic applications in different problems. For example, uh, graph spectral specification, uh, random spanning tree generation, and et cetera. So in the network design settings, uh, Gosh, Boyd and Saberi also studied a variant of the problem state here, where uh, we want to find a minimal cost subgraph with total effective resistance bonding. And uh, with uh, other co-authors, we also studied a problem where we have a single pair effective resistance constraint. Um, but in general, uh, this type of electrical network design problems uh, less we're understood, and uh, we don't have much approximation results on these problems. So ideally, we want to solve a generalized uh, survivable network design problem, which include all the constraints, all the requirements we have talked about. And fortunately, we can write a 
big, uh, large convex program for this problem. And um, all the constraints are convex. Um, um, this convex program can be solved in polynomial time using the ellipsoid method. So after uh, we get the optimal solution X for this convex program, then our goal will be designing a rounding scheme to find a good integral solution to our problem. Okay, so is the problem clear? Okay, so if no problem, then let's move on <clears throat> to talk about uh, our new result um, towards this generalized survival network design problem. So our first main result, uh, we show that there is a polynomial time randomized algorithm that returns a zero one integral solution, satisfying all the connectivity, effective resistance, algebraic connectivity constraints simultaneously with high probability. And uh, the cost of uh, the integral solution is not far away from the op uh, fractional optimal uh, C times X. Uh, we have some additive error term here where N is the number of vertices in the graph and the C max is the largest cost in the input. Um, for this additive error term, know that if the fractional optimal value C times X is at least n times c max, then this bond actually implies a constant approximation to our uh, problem. And uh, furthermore, uh, the linear packing and the covering constraints can be satisfied approximately with high probability, where we also have some additive error term um, for these constraints. Um, so we also remark that uh, our first result cannot handle the degree constraints. Okay, is the uh, statement of the result clear? Any question here? If no, then let's um, consider a simple concrete example to see how we can apply this result. Uh, consider a, a setting where the connectivity requirement for all pairs of versus U and V are at least K. Um, for example, we are in the setting of k edge connected subgraph problem. And uh, all the edge costs are from one to big O of k. So then in this setting, the optimal fractional value is at least big omega of n times c max. Um, therefore, uh, based on previous discussion, our first result gives the constant factor approximation special algorithm uh, in this setting. Um, we, we should remark that even in this very simple restricted survival network design setting, we don't know how to achieve constant approximation without using Jane's iterative rounding technique. And uh, more importantly, our algorithm achieves this constant approximation where incorporating many additional constraints, where previously each of these uh, individual spatial constraints was hard to handle. Okay. Uh, so, sorry. So, uh, if, if, um, so how, in in this result, but but you said that there are some constraints that you don't satisfy the degree constraints, right? Yeah. So yeah. here in this example, and even in the previous results, they were also not interested in the degree constraints. Um, yeah, there's not much reason. Also, for in general, survivable network design problem with degree constraints, there are some results. Yeah, there are some results. Um, but, uh, yeah. but they were also violate the degree constraint a little bit by some additive uh, error or multiplicative error. Oh, okay, okay. okay yeah, so, so, so but in general, if we only have the connectivity constraints, then the previous best known result is the James iterative rounding result, which gives constant approximation. Now, in this example, we are restricting to some like a special setting, but in, even in this special setting, we don't know how to achieve constant approximation without using Jane's technique. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so this is our first result. And our second result is the integrated gap result, where uh, with some additional assumptions on the fractional solution X, we can show there exists a Z 
zero one integral solution such that uh, the integral solution approximately satisfy all the connectivity degree effective resistance algebraic connectivity constraints simultaneously. And the cost of the solution is almost one plus epsilon times the fractional optimal. So comparing with previous result, the first result, um, we have a much stronger guarantee on the cost. We can avoid the additive error terms here. And also this result can deal with the degree constraint. But there are several drawbacks of this result. First, we can only approximately satisfy the constraints, uh, not exactly. And second, we cannot handle additional linear packing or covering constraints. And the third, a very important thing, this result is non-constructive. We don't have an algorithm. We can only bond the integrated gap. And finally, we also have uh, some additional assumptions on the fractional solution where we are saying in, uh, with respect to this fractional solution, all the uh, effective resistance between the endpoints of X should be small. And uh, there's also some merit assumptions. So these assumptions look a bit restrictive, but we actually can show there are still some interesting examples uh, captured under these assumptions. Okay, this is, uh, these are our two main results. Um, is there any question here? Maybe let me pause for uh, several seconds. Are you going to show an example uh, of where this case has happened, like the, the your assumption? Oh, here. Yeah, so uh, today maybe I don't have too much time to get into this second result. Um, I, the remaining part will be focusing on the, on the like, first result. I see. So, uh, I, uh, oh, but I think my question is like, so you're saying that these assumptions that you're making, right, like they, they appear rather often? Uh, um, do, you, yeah. do you have examples like uh, that we could see? So, Are they in the talk? If they're not, we can talk later, but... Uh, uh, yeah, so I can briefly mention that, for example, if the uh, graph uh, admit a solution which is uh, where it's bending, for example, the uh, we can find a solution with, uh, which is a good expander, then this, uh, uh, these assumptions will be met. Yeah, and uh, there are some other, like we can uh, make this assumption weaker and there are some other examples. Yeah, maybe we can talk offline. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this is uh, our two main results for the network design problems. So, Let's uh, move on to talk about our spectral approach. First, uh, let's recall some properties of the Laplacian matrix. Given a fractional solution X, we define the Laplacian matrix of the fractional solution as the sum of Xe times Le, where Le is the Laplacian matrix of a single uh, edge, which is a rank one matrix. And uh, given a vector Y, the quadratic form of the Laplacian matrix with respect to y can be written in this form. Uh, in particular, if y is an indicator vector of a set S, then the quadratic form of the Laplacian matrix uh, with respect to the fractional solution X is exactly equal to the uh, fractional value of the cut S. Okay, so this essentially is saying uh, given this single uh, Laplacian matrix, it retains the information of all graph cuts. So this is a very useful property, and people already know this uh, in the work of uh, graph spectral specification. So because of this, we observe that the underlying math question uh, for the rounding scheme of generalized survival network design problem is the following spectral, gra uh, spectral rounding problem where we are given a fractional solution X and a cost vector C, we want to find a zero one integral solution such that the Laplacian matrix of the uh, integral solution is approximately equal to the fractional Laplacian matrix. And the, the cost of the integral solution is also approximately equal to the fractional cost. Um, so if we can solve uh, this special rounding problem, 
then we can actually satisfy many constraints. For example, uh, if we can satisfy the spatial lower bound constraint, then we can satisfy all the connectivity uh, constraints. Uh, this follows by just considering the quadratic form of the indicator vector of all the cut eyes, uh, as we just talked before. Um, we can also satisfy the effective resistance constraints. Uh, this follows from the, the effective resistance uh, can be written as the pseudo uh, quadratic form of the pseudo inverse of uh, the Laplacian matrix. Um, we can also satisfy the algebraic connectivity constraint. Uh, this uh, just trivially by for, uh, checking the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian matrix. Um, I also remarked that here, if we set epsilon equals to zero, actually we can satisfy all the constraints exactly. So if we can satisfy the special upper bound, then we can also satisfy the degree constraint. This follows by just uh, simply checking the diagonal entries of the Laplacian matrices. And uh, we also remarked that in many applications, it is it might be more uh, algorithmically more convenient to control the spatial properties in order to control the combinatorial properties. So reducing to spatial rounding problem may give us some convenience, algorithmic convenience. Okay. So uh, our two main results about the uh, network design are just simple consequence from the spatial rounding problem. So let's uh, talk about some known results about the spatial rounding. So we first rephrased a result by Alan Zhu, Li, Sing, and Wang uh, as follows. They show, suppose the sum of axes is at least n of epsilon squared. Then there is a polynomial time algorithm to return a 0, 1 integral solution such that the spatial lower bound is approximately satisfied. And uh, the number of edges in the solution is at most sum of x e. Uh, so, uh, Alan Chu and Carlos use, use this result to show near optimal approximation algorithms for a, a wide family of experimental design problems. And uh, this result actually already solved the survival network design problem with uniform edge cost but the connections was not observed before. And this result is crucially relying on a regret minimization framework uh, developed for sp uh, spatial specification. So in our paper, we generalize this result to handle uh, general non-negative linear constraints. So we show there is a randomized polynomial time algorithm to return a zero one integral solution such that the spatial lower bound is exactly satisfied with high probability. And uh, for any non-negative linear constraint C, uh, we can satisfy the linear constraint uh, approximately uh, up to some additive error term with high probability. So we remark that in our algorithm, we, we don't need to know the uh, linear constraint C in advance. So our algorithm does not depend on these linear constraints. And uh, we can handle exponentially many of, of these linear constraints because the failure probability for each constraint is exponentially small. And uh, the additive error term in the upper bound here is actually um, optimal because we can show some type example for this. Okay, so this is our result for one sided spatial rounding. And our first main result for the network design is just a simple consequence of this theory. Um, then for the two sided spatial rounding, um, King, Lu, and Song shows that with some additional assumption on the fractional solution X, uh, the two sided spatial rounding is actually possible. And their result uh, is based on the, uh, the method of interlacing polynomials. So it's non-constructive. It's non the, 
we don't have algorithms for, for this problem. We can just show the existence of such an integral solution. So the statement here is not the original statement of Kim Lu and Song, but it's just a direct consequence of their main theory. Okay, so we generalize the, um, their, their result to incorporate one additional linear constraint. So we remark that here we can only handle one more. Um, maybe maybe a constant, like uh, many non-negative linear constraints. And uh, our proof is just a, a black box reduction from a rank, rank two case to the rank one case, which is studied by the King Lu and Song. Okay, so here are our uh, results for the spatial rounding. Uh, so any question here? Okay, if no, then uh, let's move on to talk, talk about some like, more technical part uh, of this talk. So we are going to talk about our algorithms for the one-sided uh, spatial rounding. So recall that this is our spatial rounding problem where we are given a fractional solution X. We want to find the integral solution Z such that uh, here we only focus on the one-sided uh, spatial bond. We want the Laplacian matrix of the integral solution is lower bounded by the uh, fractional Laplacian matrix. Uh, since each, uh, the Laplacian matrix of each edge is just a rock one matrix, uh, after doing a transformation, we can normalize the fractional solution to, to be an identity matrix. Uh, so we reduced our problem to this normalized version of spectral rounding. So this actually gives us some convenience because um, to satisfy this spectral uh, lower bound, we only need to bond the minimum eigenvalue of the integral solution. So instead of controlling the whole spectrum, so it's uh, more convenient for us to handle the problem. Okay, then um, let's take a look at some intuitions uh, about this spectral rounding problem. Uh, assume uh, we are given a set of vectors v e. We consider the matrix M, uh, which is the sum of v e, v e transpose. So this matrix M is a PSD matrix, positive semi definite matrix. <clears throat> and we, we can have the item decomposition of uh, M, where all the lambda i's here are non negative, and the ui's are the uh, eigenvectors. So this M uh, uniquely defined an uh, ellipsoid, where the axis of the ellipsoid corresponding to the eigenvectors, and the length of the half axis equals to the, uh, the length squared equals to the eigenvalues along the i. Um, so if we add one more vector v e or one uh, rank one matrix v v transpose to M then what happens to the ellipsoid? This will change the ellipsoid. Um, uh, the axis of the source may change, the length of the axis may change. But uh, the important thing is that after adding this uh, VE, VE, uh, VV transport, the ellipsoid of the matrix M will never shrink in any of the directions. It only becomes larger and larger. And also know that uh, all the vectors here actually must be contained within the ellipsoid. So this, demo, uh, this demonstration may not be uh, like, uh, the most precise, but at least this gives us some uh, intuitions. So with this picture in mind, uh, let's consider what do we want to do in the one-sided spectral rounding. So assume we are given the input vectors v e, and uh, we, are a pro we are promised that after rescaled by a factor of x e to each vector v e, then the corresponding ellipsoid becomes a unibore. Uh, this is our input. And uh, with this input, in the one-sided spectral rounding, we want to find a subset of vectors such that the corresponding ellipsoid completely contain, contains the unibore 
uh, in, in this ellipsoid. Okay, so this is some like pictures in our mind. We want to find such an ellipsoid contained the uniball. But how can we find, uh, select the vectors? Assume this uh, red ellipsoid is our current solution. Um, let this AT be a density matrix, which means all the eigenvalues are non negative and the sum of eigenvalues equals to one. Uh, informally, a uh, density matrix gives a measure of uh, all the directions on the unisphere. And different directions may have different priorities according to AT. So assume AT can give higher priority to those uh, directions that not were covered by the current solution. For example, this brute, uh, this brute one gives higher priority to the direction which now we are covered by the, by the current solution, say t minus one. Then, then actually this AT can guide us to select the vectors into our solution set. For example, we can select uh, a vector VET in this direction, which uh, pointing to the now we are covered direction of our current solution. By adding this vector into our solution set, then we are improving our, our solution. Okay, so now the problem is how can we uh, find such a ZT? So our choice of this ZT comes from uh, the regret minimization framework. But today probably I don't have too much time to get into much details of the framework. Um, for today's purpose, uh, we only need to know this AT comes from this optimization problem. Uh, AT is the optimizer of, of this uh, optimization problem, where this function psi is the regular, regularization function, and alpha is a learning rate parameter, which ba balances these two terms. Um, for the regularizer psi, there are uh, different choices. A popular choice is the entropy function, um, but for today's purpose, we will use uh, IR half regularizer, which is defined as this. Uh, Alan Zhu, Leo, and Arichia use uh, this regularizer, gives an uh, optimal bound for the spatial specification. And with this uh, IR half regularizer, uh, we can have a closed form solution for AT here, uh, written in this form, where this LT, we can treat it as a lower bound um, for the minimum eigenvalue of alpha z t minus one. And the RT is the unique value such that this AT is a density matrix. So this AT is uniquely defined. And uh, maybe let's uh, again try to get some intuition about this uh, AT. Uh, what does the ellipsoid look like? With so assume uh, this z t minus one, this red ellipsoid is our current solution. Um, we want to see how this rescaled uh, matrix AT looks like. So first, we shrink each axis of ZT minus one by a fixed amount of X LT over alpha. And then we change each, the length of each half axis of the reciprocal, uh, of the ellipsoid to the reciprocal of the current length squared according to this formula. Okay, so proof by picture. So this group, uh, group ellipsoid actually is what we want because it gives high priority to those direction that now we are covered. And uh, we may, may ask, why do we need this like uh, intermediate step? Um, why not we just take the inverse of ZT? So the reason of uh, subtracting LT over half, uh, over alpha here is that after subtracting a fixed amount from all the directions, so those directions corresponding to the row eigenspace of the current solution becomes more important. So those directions of the now we are covered uh, directions becomes more important. We will give uh, even higher priority to those directions. So and these directions are indeed those directions we want to, which work hard to improve. Okay, so this is just some uh, intuition about the AT. So this AT will be served as a guidance for, to us to how to select our, our vectors. 
Okay, so uh, with this choice of AT comes from the IR half regulator, and the regret minimization framework uh, can give us a lower bound uh, on the minimum eigenvalue. So suppose in each iteration T, we are selecting a vector VET, and then the minimum eigenvalue of sum of, uh, of our integral solution can be lower bounded by this term. Uh, this a little bit complicated term. So for each of the terms in the summation here, we call it the progress at the uh, uh, iteration T, which equals to the difference of two trace functions here. And the equality follows from the uh, Sherman and Morrison formula, uh, uh, rank one update uh, formula. So let's consider the first term here. The first term, first trace is essentially the trace of AT to the half. And this is fixed uh, at the step T once the current solution ZT max one is given. And then in the second term here, the red term, we are adding the current, uh, the vector VET to our current solution. Uh, after adding this uh, vector VET, uh, we are actually pushing our solution uh, away from the lower bound LT here. So the further we are away from the lower bound, the larger progress we can make according to this formula. So this naturally in, uh, induces a potential function, uh, which is this red term, could be our potential function, which can get us to select our vectors. So actually, uh, Alan Zhu, Lee, Sing, and Wang in their uh, ICML conference paper, they give a natural greedy strategy based on this lower bound. So essentially, in each iteration, we just pick a vectors VET to maximize the progress here. And uh, when all the vectors have the same cost, and um, we are allowed to pick a multi-set solution, so the greedy algorithm were uh, satisfy the special lower bound exactly with at most uh, um, over epsilon number of vectors more than the optimal solution. So this gives a, a greedy solution in the uniform cost case. To deal with the general uh, cost case, our idea is to use the random sampling. So here is our uh, randomized algorithm. The first step, we do the normalization, and then we, uh, in each iteration t, we maintain maintain a density matrix at uh, come from the L half regularizer. Then we sample uh, each uh, in iteration in each iteration we sample h e t according to this sample sampling probability or proportional to this term. Um, let's take a closer look at this sampling probability. So if we are just sampling according to XE, so this is just independent rounding. Uh, we are just sampling each edge independently. So this will preserve the cost uh, of our solution with high probability, but it cannot satisfy the spatial lower bound. So we add a, a term to adjust. Here, this term, the adjustment term here, comes from the denominator of the progress term. Um, according to our intuition, the matrix AT will actually gives higher probability to rows vectors VE pointing to the directions of rows like nowhere covered directions. So if VE is in the direction of nowhere covered direction of a current solution, then there we will choose this vector with higher priority. So this helps us to improve the minimum eigenvalue. And after an uh, appropriate chosen number of iterations, then we just return all the sampled edges. Okay, so this is just our algorithm, very simple. And uh, any, any question here? Okay, if no, then let's move on to consider the analysis of the algorithm. So recall that uh, with the, our choice of AT, then we have this spatial lower bound. And then according to our sampling uh, distribution, 
when the algorithm terminates, the expected spectral lower bound here is approximately greater than one. And uh, the expected cost uh, of our solution is uh, at most the fractional cost plus some uh, additive error term here. And so essentially this says, in expectation, we are good in both the spectral lower bound and the, in the cost of our solution. But uh, we, if we want to show we can achieve both of these simultaneously, we need some concentration result. Um, but the issue here is like the different iterations, they are dependent because the sampling probability is with respect to AT, where AT is defined uh, with respect to the current solution ZT minus one. So all the iterations, they are dependent. But fortunately, we can define a martingale uh, for this random process. And the concentration for follows from the martingale inequalities. And uh, I think I don't have too much time to get into the details here. Um, OK, so essentially, um, we can show in expectation we are good. And uh, also, we have some concentration. So finally, our solution will have satisfy the spectral lower bound and the cost of our solution will be good with high probability. So the main idea is, uh, is just very simple. And so just one issue with this algorithm. The issue is that uh, we almost achieve uh, all we want for the one set is spectral rounding, except that we can only return a multi-set solution because in each iteration, we are sampling the edges from the whole set of uh, options, uh, the whole set of all the possible edges. So we only have an integral or like multi-set solution here. So to, to recover the zero one solution result, a uh, uh, natural strategy is uh, just simple. In each iteration, we just sample edges from the remaining set of edges. Uh, this uh, strategy actually gives a randomized version of the algorithm in Alan Zhu Lee Singh and Wang's conference paper. Um, the analysis follows the similar idea uh, as I just presented in the previous slide, um, but just the calculations are more involved. But more importantly, um, this result only gives us a weaker bond uh, on the cost we cannot recover the optimal bond uh, for the multi-set solution. So to recover the optimal bond for the multi-set solution, we, we can use this uh, strategy where we randomize the swapping vectors, which means in each iteration, we remove some vectors or some edges from our current solution set and uh, add some vectors from remaining set uh, random, randomly. So the probability of adding uh, a new vector is essentially the same as previous, but the probability of removing a vector is also very intuitive, where if the fractional value of this, this vector is large, then we remove it uh, with small probability. And if uh, a vector is pointing to the nowhere covered direction of current solution, then we are also removing it with small probability. Okay, so this uh, sampling probability uh, doing the swap is uh, very intuitive. And this actually gives a randomized version of the local search algorithm in uh, Alan Zhu and Coors's follow up work uh, for their experimental design paper. And with this randomized swapping strategy, um, the analysis of the cost will become uh, more complicated. We need to prove a uh, different concentration inequality um, to do the analysis. Okay, so, um, so this uh, essentially is the algorithm. And uh, let's, uh, let's move on to, to the conclusion and open problem part. So as a conclusion, the main contribution of this work uh, is to propose a spectral approach 
to design an approximation algorithm for network design problems. And then we show that the techniques developed in spectral graph theory and the discrepancy theory can be used to significantly extend the scope of network design problems. And uh, we believe this connection will bring new techniques and uh, stronger results for network design. And uh, we'll also introduce new formulations and interesting problems to spectral graph theory and the discrepancy theory. Um, as for some open problems, uh, the first one, can we fully recover J's iterative rounding results with spectral approach? Uh, now we can only match James results in some special setting. And uh, the second open problem is, can, can we get some more refined special running results in, spe in some special settings? For example, can we get better dependence in epsilon with only the effective resistance constraints? Okay, uh, like concludes today's talk. Thank you. So, any questions here? Okay, I'll just clap for everybody. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Talk and yeah, questions are up. Hi, Hom. It's Anna. Um, oh, yeah. It's a nice talk. Can I ask something? Way back at the beginning, you said one of the motivations was um, something about transit time in a graph. Uh, Okay, yeah. Uh, this slide? Uh, yeah, fast commute time between two vertices. What does that mean? Oh, commute time means uh, it's uh, like a quantity related to a uh, run and walk. So it means from a vertex U, you, you, in the run and walk, you travel to a, another vertex V and then get back to U. It's this, uh, the expected time, the commute time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So oh, any other questions? Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I will thank Hong again in, in, on behalf of everybody. So, okay, Hong, thanks, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, okay, let me stop recording so we can.